Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh, and there's Chuck, and we are 10 years old right now, and this is Stuff You Should Know. Can I go ahead and admit something? Oh, yes. I'm nervous, though, but yes, go ahead. Well, I was a little bit old for Nintendo, the NES system, Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's not to say that kids my age weren't playing it, but like... It really boomed in popularity right when I was sort of like 15, 16 Mm -hmm. and starting to sort of drive and get out in the world. Right. Uh, And I also did not own one. So, like, I never played Mario Kart and Zelda and sort of these classic games. Uh, Eventually, in college, I remember it had to have been a Super Nintendo in, like, 92. Yeah. Uh, My roommate had one, so that's where I first started playing Uh, Super Mario World, Mm -hmm. and I played stuff like Tetris and Mario on the Game Boy Mm -hmm. that my brother had, but I've never owned a Nintendo. Well, I can tell you that Nintendo came out, and I was 10, 11 years old, not driving yet. Wheelhouse. And and I owned one, too. (laughs) So it was definitely in my wheelhouse. Yeah, I mean, later in college, my my good friend Clay got the first PlayStation— and that's where we started going with Street Fighter and Mortal Kombat. And mm-hmm. then I got on the PlayStation train. But I, it's just funny reading through this. I was like, I played some of these games here and there, but I was not Nintendo kid. Yeah, I have to say I jumped from Nintendo. I never had a Super Nintendo or a Sega Genesis, but I have friends who had those. Um, went off into the N64 world with uh, GoldenEye. Yeah. You played my, that, right? <laughs> my friend John had one of those, and I played a lot of that. That was so great. And then I, I got the first PlayStation 2, the first PlayStation, I mean, not to be confusing. Mm-hmm. Um, and at that point, I realized that I was thinking about how to play games while I was not playing games, like when I was just walking around living life. And I made a decision, a very fateful decision that I've never regretted, that I was going to give up video games <laughs> because I was too addicted to them. Oh, and wow. This was, this was college, and I, it was, I never looked back. Wow. So you were into them, huh? I was big time into them, yeah. It was it was like, this is, if, if it's reaching out from beyond the time I'm playing it, then yes, I was a little too into them, if you ask me. Well, I was never a gamer or anything like yeah. that. I just really enjoyed playing games, maybe a little too much. In your favor, uh, in your defense, rather, I would say that I think everyone who's ever played like Tetris has Tetris dreams and sees the world mm-hmm. as like Tetris boards occasionally, if you're into it. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, my deal, as you know, said before, is I, I was heavy Atari kid, big-time arcade kid, yeah. and then played this kind of stuff with friends here and there. And then now every year I'll usually, or every couple of years, I'll get two or three PlayStation games, play them obsessively for a couple of months, and then it sits for nine months to a year. Yeah. I'm with you. I think that's healthy. That's a healthy way to play video games, you know? Yeah, I, I still enjoy it, though. It's a lot of fun. Uh but, yeah, my, my buddy Doug Dillard growing up had one rich friend, <laughs> and he had a Intellivision. And mm-hmm. so I had kind of some fun today watching the old – because I remember thinking the Intellivision football was really great. And <laughs> when I looked at it today, I mean, it's very, very basic, but it was pretty good still. Like, you're calling plays, and uh, all the sounds came flooding back. It was a big rush of nostalgia. Yeah. Um, it's somehow two-bit graphics, I think. Yeah. And this, to be clear, what we're going to talk about today is the the original NES. This could have been a two-parter if we would have gone down the road of the 64. Like, we're not even talking about the music today at all. No, no. Uh-uh. Uh, so there was plenty more material here, but this is just a bit of an homage for the Christmas season. Yeah, because, I mean, it's the holidays, so... One of the greatest things you can do during the holidays is reminisce nostalgically about holidays past. (laughs) And I definitely associate the NES or other. I didn't realize this until I started researching it. Some people call it the NES. Did you know that? No. Really? Yes. Yeah, some actual, like, legit gamers call it NES. Other people call it NES, and apparently there's some big disagreement. I've always called it NES. Yeah. But I always associate the NES with a pretty significant portion of my life. Yeah. it, like, it always is tied to Christmas as well. All right. Well, you're, you're going to wax nostalgic a bit more, even though I, I did play a little bit of these here and there. Okay. So, um, one of the things, like, the, the Nintendo Entertainment System has a, an amazingly great 
story mm-hmm. to it. Like, it's it's just so fun to tell because Nintendo came along at a time when uh, the video game market in North America had so totally bottomed out yeah. that people looked at video games. Like, imagine, think about how big Atari was. People looked at it, it crashed so hard that they, it was a fad that was never <laughs> coming back. Like, it had already lived its life. Yeah. And Nintendo walked into this burning um, city that was the video game industry mm-hmm. and said, let's give this another shot. And they actually managed to succeed. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Atari was dead as disco. Uh, we talked a little bit about it before, especially in the E.T. episode. Mm-hmm. And I did a full Atari guest two-parter with uh, Strickland Yeah, back in the day on uh, on Tech Stuff. I bet that was a fun one. It was a lot of fun, but yeah, uh, ET came along and and certainly didn't kill Atari, but it helped usher in the end of Atari. And it wasn't just this one game; it was uh, sort of a flash in the pan for a few years. And parents were also weighing in and saying, mm-hmm. "You know, um, I don't like my kid playing this much garbage on the television. Like, I it, I don't think it's good for their brains. I don't think it was a part of this satanic panic necessarily." It was pre-Satanic Panic. It was more along the lines of you're riding your brain. Right. So um, I, I, was that the thing that triggered it, or was it the terrible, terrible games that really triggered the what's called the North American video game crash of 1983? It was the games, wasn't it? Well, I mean, I think it was a two-part thing. Like, kids got a little less interested because the games started to suck, quite frankly. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I think you also had parents beating the drum of, okay. hey, and, and Atari wasn't really coming out with, you know, the new systems weren't that great. The the 2600 and the 5200 came along, mm-hmm. or, I mean, rather the 5200 followed up, and it was just okay. So they needed, something needed to happen, and that thing that needed to happen was Nintendo. Yeah, and also at the same time, one of the other things that had ushered, helped usher out video games was um, the personal computer starting to come into the world. Absolutely. And with the personal computer, you could, like, do your taxes. Your kid could, like, practice math. Mm-hmm. And they played games on floppy disk, too. So Castle I Wolfenstein. Thought, exactly. <laughs> yes. I played Wolfenstein. And, oh, I'm so glad you said that because I was looking at Castlevania on floppy disk, and I'm oh. like, it came out in 1990? Like, I was definitely playing it before that. It was Wolfenstein. Yeah, Wolfenstein. Thank you, man. You just made a, a really great neural pathway <laughs> circuit, like, connect completely oh, in my brain. That feels good. But I saw it described by a guy named Chris Kohler, who wrote an article on this in Wired back in 2010. He said that video games were dead, dead, dead. Personal computers were the future, and anything that just played games and couldn't do your taxes was hopelessly backward. Yeah. That was kind of like the the premise. So just to get across, I don't want to like beat this drum too hard, but to get across how huge the crash was, the video game crash of North America, um, in 1982, Atari raked in $2 billion, yeah. Atari alone. In 1983, they lost <laughs> $536 million. That's a swift fall. Yes, but that's how quickly that it happened. And so people basically, if, if it crashes that hard, people hate your product. And I think that's kind of where we were at in 1983. Yeah, but as you pointed out, this was, we need to keep pointing out, this was the North American crash. Yeah, good point. It did not happen in Japan. Um, in 1983, they were just like, I don't know what you're talking about because we have <laughs> arcades over here that are flourishing. Uh, we invented Donkey Kong. And mm-hmm. Donkey Kong Jr., it's still yep. a lot of fun to play. Those games are still fun to play. Yeah, for sure. And in 1980, this was a few years before the United States crash, they said, hey, you know what? There's this gaming thing going on, uh, home gaming going on in America, and maybe we should get together a team over here to just sort of poke around because we're Nintendo. We make a lot of toys, and we have for a long time, and we're big in the arcade world, but we don't have a really a console system going. Right. And that led to, uh, a be- I think actually there was a console called the Epoch Cassette Vision, in 1981, and it, it was sort of the biggest <laughs> thing in Japan at the time. But Well, it, I think it was kind of the only thing in Japan at the time, too. Well, which makes it the biggest. I guess you could also say <laughs> it was the smallest. That's true. Uh, but it was not a Nintendo product, right? No, it absolutely it was wasn't. Epoch, in fact, it was 
it was Nintendo came along as a rival to to this um, cassette vision, Epoch cassette vision. Um, so the head of Nintendo, Hiroshi Yamauchi, um, he apparently was this driving force. He had some really great people working for him in Japan and in North America. But he seems to have been this person who would be like, um, do this enormous undertaking and do it in an hour Mm -hmm. kind of thing. He kind of seems to have had a sense that there was a really narrow window that was open right now that could close at any time and that they needed to get this stuff done, but they also needed to do it really well and really right, basically, out of the gate. And they actually managed to because in 1983, after just a couple of years of research and development, they released what's called the Famicom or the Family Computer, which was essentially the direct predecessor of the Nintendo Entertainment System that they released a couple of years later in North America. Yeah, I mean, it's not very often that a head of a company or a boss comes along and says, I want to do something better and cheaper than it, mm-hmm. what is currently out there. And it actually happened. Uh, and listeners at home, if you can look this stuff up as you go safely, please do. Because just seeing these all these various units we're going to talk about is really a lot of fun. Yeah, they teeter on the edge of being creepy. They're like at that age. They're not quite wicker wheelchair creepy, but they're getting there. Give them another decade or so. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think they're cool looking. I mean, this is the kind of thing that would look cool sitting on a shelf as a collector these days. I think there's a lot of people who have that, actually. Oh, I'm sure. Um, So look up the Epoch cassette vision because that's kind of fun. But the Famicom was this red and white box. Uh, It top-loaded. It had two wired controllers, and it had, very importantly, on the control pad, it had a, it had the D-pad. It had the directional pad on, on the left with the up and down, left and right arrows, mm-hmm. and then an A and B button, which no one knew at the time, but that would kind of revolutionize the gaming world as, you know, they got a little fancier over the years, but it's still sort of, that's still the bones of what a controller is. Absolutely. Like it was, I I can never remember the full quote, but somebody said it was like they invented the airplane uh, and got it right fully out of the gate, Yeah, like tray tables and everything, essentially. It was like, that's what they did with that that controller design. Uh, And now you think about it, you look at it like the Nintendo brick and especially the um, Famicom controllers, they look so old fashioned. Yeah. But if you can put yourself in the mindset of somebody in Japan in 1983, mm-hmm. if you looked around at the other stuff available, it was it was just from the future. And that was one of the things that Nintendo did really, really well during this period. They figured out what everyone thought what the future was, what it contained, what it looked like, and they gave it to everybody. It was a really, like, exuberant time. It was like the future had been brought to the present, and it was all thanks to Nintendo, basically. So it retailed for about 150 bucks back then, which is, what, close to 500 today? Yeah, 400 something like that. All right. So, I mean, kind of on par with, you know, the range of even modern gaming. I mean, what's the new PlayStation, like, 5 maybe? I don't know. I'm not sure. I think it's somewhere in there, five or 600 bucks. Do you remember that PlayStation ad that was like for PlayStation 7? It was just people running around the real world. It was all like VR and augmented reality. I don't remember that. It was pretty cool because it came out in like the 90s and you're like, ooh, and <laughs> we're pretty close to that now already, you know? Oh, for sure. Uh, they, they bundled the Donkey Kong and Donkey Kong Jr. games and the Popeye games, which uh, were basically about the same quality as you would get at the arcade. Yeah, and that was huge. It was a huge deal. I mean, especially if you grew up playing Atari. Uh, I loved Atari, but Atari was Atari, and it had a lot of limits. And this was, you know, you went to the arcade so you could play games better than Atari. You now you could do it at home. Right, yeah. So that was an enormous progression. But it wasn't just, like, the graphics, the quality of the the look of it. It was also the gameplay, too. Like, it was way more fun than most of the games you were going to play on an Atari. It was just funner to play some of these um, Famicom games. Um, and it, it took off like a rocket. Uh, it knocked the Epoch um, cassette vision yeah. right off of the top place. Into the history books, basically. Essentially, yeah. They sold half a million units uh, in two months after its release. Uh, I think by the end of 1984, they'd sold two and a half million units. Yeah. So in about a year or so. And they were like, okay, I think we're definitely on to something. And they had enough hubris, enough, I guess, at least self-assurance 
that they set their sights on North America, again, which was a tattered, burning ruin <laughs> as far as video games were concerned. It's a great spot for a break. I think so, too. All right. I think where we left off, uh, the United States was a version of Cormac McCarthy's The Road. Yeah, and, yeah. <laughs> and The Walking Dead. And Nintendo came along and said, we are going to save you and bring you into the future. Mm -hmm. And it was a tough sell at first in the U.S. because, like you said, the video game uh, craze, uh, for lack of a better word, had kind of come and gone. This was 1985. Parents were still not, you know, they were like, I'm glad that went away, basically. And yeah. now we have these PCs in our homes, and my kid can play Oregon Trail or whatever, and they seem happy enough with that. And uh, Nintendo knew all this was going on. They knew it was going to be a tougher sell. They, they knew, so they knew they had to come up with something awesome. And their first crack at that was something called the the AVS, the Advanced Video System. And they said, "Well, give it a keyboard, so it looks like a computer. Mm -hmm. It'll have a little cassette disc drive. It'll be able to do some stuff. It'll, but it, you know, they bundled it with all kinds of fun stuff. It had a joystick, it had a keyboard, like a musical keyboard, right? And it had this uh, wireless, which is we'll explain how all this works in a little bit. It's pretty cool, but it had a little ray gun, a little zapper." Yeah, and you really said a mouthful with the word wireless, man. This yeah. was 1985, and this advanced video system came out with wireless controllers. Like, it was, that's really impressive. And it was really slick looking, too, like really futuristic looking. But also, yes, they put enough computer um, peripherals in it that it, did, it didn't look like a video game system, right? Yeah. So they, they took it to CES, the, the January um, version, that I think even back then was in Vegas. Um, but it's, sorry, it's the Consumer Electronics Show, right? Yeah, I've never been to that, have you? No, huh? Strickland has great stories from it, though. Yeah, he goes every year, I think. I think so. But at CES in January of 1985, they're like, here you go, everybody. Here's the future, the advanced video system. <laughs> and no one cared at all about it. Yeah. They didn't even get people coming over to play, to mess around. No one could have cared less about that thing. Yeah, which is a little bit surprising looking back uh, because the games were good and they knew that I guess they were just a little gun shy, uh, but it seems like Atari made so much money. Mm -hmm. I'm surprised there wasn't someone that was like, "Hey, maybe round two uh, is going to be a real thing." But it, you know, it didn't work. They didn't get any response. No, and I think that really goes to just kind of underline just how bad a reputation video games yeah. had. Because you know, Dave points out that um, the the consoles that had been going for like a hundred, a hundred and fifty dollars the year before. These retailers were stuck with them, and yeah. they were selling them for like forty bucks, mm -hmm. which is how much the the games used to go for. Now the games were like four dollars. So the the retailers have been so badly burned. I think they all got caught with these hot potatoes when the crash happened that they were like never again. Yeah, and that's what Nintendo was working against. Which is as Dave Dave again Dave helped us with this as he points out. You were either a very foolish company to try this or a very smart one because again it had a terrible reputation, but that also meant that there was no competition in this enormous market right now. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so they knew they had to have al almost like a trick to get their foot in the door. Mm -hmm. And they came up with one. And um, they found this, uh, is Gaming Historian, is it a, I know it had a YouTube channel, but is it also just a full website? I don't know. All I know is the the YouTube channel where they make really high quality yeah. YouTube videos that are really interesting. It's good stuff. But someone at Gaming Historian came up with this very apt metaphor about a Trojan horse. And that's kind of what they were looking for was a way to get these things in the home by almost tricking parents into thinking it wasn't a gaming system. And it was more just sort of like a toy because kids still got and bought or, uh, you know, received toys and stuff. It's not like they shut down the toy industry. Right. It was just home video games. So what they invented was the ROB, the R-O-B, the Robotic Operating Buddy, which is a very <laughs> sweet name. Yeah. You should totally go look at ROB online and especially YouTube videos of ROB in action mm -hmm. and just be prepared for the speed 
of <laughs> Rob. Right. right. But the thing is, Rob was a robot. He moved and he functioned. He interacted with the games that they came up with. Very slowly. <laughs> Right, very slowly. But this was a time where, like, robots were kind of hard to come by. Yeah. Like, they were not, like, it was not an easy thing to get your hands on. And now, all of a sudden, there's this company saying, like, hey, we have this whole thing, and it has a robot, too. Yeah. And it was one of the greatest strokes of, of marketing genius that any company's ever come up with, as we'll see. Yeah, I mean, what they ended up with was a robot that didn't, uh, I mean, it functioned as it should, but like I said, it's super, super slow. They only mm -hmm. ended up having a couple of games where you could use the robot. Mm -hmm. And it was just sort of a sneaky way to get these uh, consoles in the door. and Because yep. it was all part of the same system. And and that's how it worked. They, they managed to get the little Trojan horse robot through the door. And uh, thanks to a guy named uh, Lance Barr... Mm -hmm. uh, he he helped design a lot of this stuff. He designed the Zapper Ray Gun, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a sec. Mm -hmm. But he designed it as a front-loading system, which made sort of people think of VCRs. It was also a very, um, they call it a zero-force solution. So there wasn't a lot of wear on the on the uh, cartridges, and it yeah. you know it just worked really well. Plus, it lo it looked, like you said, it looked like a VCR. Those were wildly popular at the time. And um, I don't think we said, Chuck, so that January CES was um, just a, a complete, like, catastrophe for Nintendo. They'd spent all this time coming up with the advanced um, video system, and it, it went nowhere. So, again, the head of the company, Hiroshi Yamauchi, told a couple of people, like, hey, redesign this in an hour. And they did. And Lance Barr was the guy who did it. And he knocked it out of the park because the NES, as it debuted later on in, in North America, was essentially what he came up with in that one hour that he was given to do it. Um, so they, had, they did all this and had it done in time for the July 1985 CES. Like six months after that huge colossal failure, mm -hmm. they went back to the drawing board and came back in six months with the Nintendo Entertainment System fully fleshed out, including Robot and Zapper Gun. Well, notably Robot, because that's what it, all anyone cared about at first. Yeah, for sure. Like at CES, the, the NES system was sort of to the side, and everyone was just trying to get their hands on Rob. Mm -hmm. and play Gyromite, <laughs> right. which I'm telling you, you got to just spend five minutes watching Rob play this game because it shows a split screen of the the TV screen of what's happening on the game, which really isn't mm -hmm. much. And then Rob just very slowly picking up these spindle tops and making them spin. Yeah, and I, I, was it the... Um, the um Game historian video that sh that really kind of went into detail about how Rob played and setting up his accessories and everything. I, I watched a bunch of them. Yeah, I'm uh, not sure. Okay, if that was well, one I of them. think it was that one. If not, it was another one I saw where they they really kind of showed like the the idea of Rob was pretty ingenious. Sure, like, he he was player two, but you were actually playing together. Yeah, like you uh, in Gyro might you were kind of running through this maze, and there were like pillars that you couldn't get past. You had to get Rob to do it for you. And again, he go would eat move some lunch. so slowly. Yeah, <laughs> come back. Get, get, go get an eye exam and your glasses uh -huh. made in an hour or two. Um, and then, yeah, he would have completed that, and you could advance to the next column or whatever. It was a great idea. It was a cool concept, but it just the execution was terrible. But he essentially just pushed the buttons on the player two controller. So if you got tired and frustrated of waiting for Rob, you you could just push the buttons on the player two controller yourself mm -hmm. and play Gyromite that way. But the point was. They, they don't seem, in retrospect, to have really thought Rob was going to take off. Um, in fact, the games that, that they, he came with in North America were the Japanese versions. They hadn't even bothered to make the North American version of these. They just put, like, kind of this, like, um, like fix on it that made it compatible yeah. with the North American system. But when you loaded up Gyromite, it, the, the, um, the intro screen showed the Japanese name yeah. for it <laughs> at the very beginning of it. I feel like I saw other games that had Japanese writing and stuff. Yeah? I don't know. Maybe. It's a memory. Um, it may have just been like boot-up screens or something. Mm -hmm. So they decide uh, it was such a you know eye-grabber at CES that they decided, all right, let's go to New York City and let's test it out there mm -hmm. in one city, roll it out, see what happens. The New York retailer said... Hey, buddy, I got 
look at this. I got a warehouse full of Ataris over here that I can't even give away. Like, I don't know about a new gaming system. And they said, all right, here's what we'll do. We will ship them to your store from Japan for free. We will, you can just sell what you sell and pay us for those. Whatever you don't sell, you can return to us. We'll take them back. We'll wow. send over a team in your store to set up these big marketing, interactive marketing displays. And we'll we'll take on all of the risk. And all you guys got to do is try and sell some of these. And they went, yeah, all right. <laughs> <laughs> that was a great Joe Pesci, by the way. I meant to <laughs> oh, say. Joe Pesci. So yeah, they did this in 500 stores and normally when you when you did like kind of a, a soft test release of something like this, you might choose like Topeka, Kansas or somewhere that no one cares about, right? <laughs> but they went full <laughs> bore and hit New York City and I think I've seen it, you know, mentioned a few times that like it was based on that that Frank Sinatra song, the idea that you if you made it in New York, you could make it anywhere and they what they song? did make it in New York. Um <laughs> Oh, I can't remember. I, uh, I, I want to 21. rock. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> I want to rock. So, I want to hear that version. <laughs> man, I've got that MP3. It's so good. It still holds up. Of I want to rock? Yeah, the Twisted Sister song. You got that MP3? <laughs> <laughs> or MP4. I don't know what the Where'd kids you buy call it? these days. Uh, I bought it at Toys R Us. Awesome. Very cool. So um, they they didn't knock it out of the park Necessarily, they sold about half the units that they had produced for this test market in New York. Yeah, um, I think like fifty thousand. But it was enough for Yamauchi to say, "Let's give this a try. Let's let's roll out to the rest of the country." Another bold move because normally after your first test, um, uh, like run your first test market, you do like four or five more. And he said, "No, let's skip that. Let's just go right to the rest of the country." And he did. Yeah, and that was the the Christmas season too. So, uh, it, I, I get the feeling that they were, um, they weren't super disappointed, but they weren't super pumped either. It, it felt like it was right in that area, and it's funny looking back historically, like it was right in that zone where it was just enough to keep it going. Right, and you wonder kind of the the sliding doors pathways that the gaming world would have taken had it sold thirty thousand units. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. I, I saw somebody say, like, that Nintendo, had Nintendo not been successful, like, the games as we know them today would definitely not exist. We'd still be playing checkers like a bunch of dopes. Yeah, and going outside. <laughs> Who needs it? <laughs> so, that was 1985 holiday season. Um, ni- by 1986, they uh, cl- they hit on something else. So, like, one of the things that they did was take a poll of that uh, people in the test market who had bought the Nintendo. And I think, like, the vast majority of them said that um, Rob, the robot, was the reason they had bought the whole system to get that robot. That's how, that's how well that marketing ploy worked. So... Um, Rob had kind of served his purpose, though. Everyone knew he was slow. They weren't releasing more games for them. So they came up with, um, originally, the, the the way you bought Nintendo, it was the Nintendo Entertainment System console, mm-hmm. two controllers, Good. the zapper gun, nice. Rob the Robot, and all of yeah. Rob the Robot's accessories, and then two games, one of which was Gyromite, that game you play with Rob, yeah. right? yeah. Okay, that's a lot of stuff, and of course it was pretty expensive at the time. So for the national rollout, they kept the deluxe set, but they also came up with something called the NES Control Deck, which was just the console, two um, controllers, and very, very importantly, Super Mario Brothers. And that was 99 bucks, and they sold those things as fast as they could make them for the holidays that year. Yeah, you really can't overstate the importance of Super Mario Brothers. Uh, that was a game that came along in uh, with actually with the Famicom in 1985, mm-hmm. and it was just it was the most advanced looking game and playing game that any kid had ever seen. Uh, it was, uh, as Dave points out, it was the first game that you could play and and have fun playing for forever. Like you could go on and on finding the hidden worlds, finding the Easter eggs, mm-hmm. dropping down pipes into other sections that you and other levels that you never even knew existed, uh, banging away hidden bricks. Like there were so many discoveries and places to go in Super Mario Brothers. They created um, sort of a new way of gaming, which was like, <laughs> hey, how would you like to be little Josh Clark? 
How put put your cigarette down? <laughs> How would you like to play a video game, the same one for the next seven hours? Hot dog. <laughs> That's what I would have said. And that really gone, <laughs> hot dog. <laughs> it, it was a whole new deal though, because even when I played Atari, like we played for hours at a time, but I don't know, you played a game for 30, 45 minutes and you'd pop in another one. That's why you had like right. 40 games in your right. in your controller box. Because none of them you could play for hours and hours and hours in a row and not eventually be like, okay, this is getting a little bit old, even as a kid. Yeah. So the gameplay was just Light years ahead of anything. Uh, I, I, I've almost every single uh, source that I've seen on the internet that talks about how Super Mario Brothers changed things uses the word light years ahead yeah. of everything else because it really was. Um, there was a guy named Shigeru Miyamoto. He designed the game very famously. He's, he obviously became a legend overnight because of it. They were also smart enough to do some really savvy marketing moves, which uh, kind of rolled out in a few different ways. They Well, they had a lot of advertising money. That was sort of a given. They had about $20 million bucks mm-hmm. uh, to spend off the bat, which is a ton of money for advertising uh, now and then. But they created a call center. Uh, they trained these uh, players and these gamers, basically, to master these games and sit on the phone. And you could call a number if you got stuck and talked to a human being that could, mm-hmm. like, walk you through a level that you couldn't get through. Yeah. Uh, they had Nintendo Power Magazine, which is a very big deal. And they created the first, you know, gaming championships where, uh, and these are still just huge, you know, where kids and adults alike, you know, now adults from all over the world come together to battle each other out. And the very first ones were created by Nintendo uh, yeah. with the, the Grand Championships at Universal Studios Hollywood. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that. But yeah, you can make the case that they created the esports phenomenon or they laid the groundwork for it to come at least, right? I would think so. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So um, there was a poll of Nintendo players after the national rollout um, that found that 95% of teens polled said that they recommended the NES to their friends. And then I think 83% of adults and 85% of little kids. That is eye-popping. And that, that means that they were successful. They used Rob to get their feet in the door, and they knew that if they just got their console in the hands of Americans, they would change their minds forever about video games, and that's exactly what happened. And they avoided the Atari mistake, which was uh, they did their best to try and keep bad games uh, from being able to play it on their system, and that's what happened with Atari. The, the games got so bad. Uh, I mean, there are hundreds and hundreds. We talked about this in the E.T., uh, game episode like ET gets unfairly piled upon because it was just such a big release, mm-hmm. but there were far worse games released uh, on the Atari system, hundreds and hundreds of really really bad games that just no one even remembers. And Nintendo saw this play out in America and knew that they couldn't let that happen to them, so they designed a, a proprietary system where you could only play officially licensed NES games. They created a lock mm-hmm. chip on their circuit board and only Nintendo officially licensed games or manufactured games had the lock key or the key chip uh, to unlock it. And that really kept quality control, you know, under their wing. They said, even to third parties, they said, you can only make uh, two of these games a year. Like don't come at us with 200 games, like make something Mm -hmm. really, really good that Mm -hmm. we'll approve of. And we will put the Nintendo seal of quality on the front of the cover. Yeah, and, like, they were really nitpicky, too. Like, as you were developing the game, you needed to send Nintendo, like, um, explanations of the gameplay, uh, the characters, the design, all that stuff. And Nintendo would make notes and send it back and make you change stuff. Um, And that's what you could do if you had 80% of the market uh, as far as video games were because people had to come to you. And it was really smart for them to just kind of protect their intellectual property like that because it was so good. But um, they were basically so um, heavy-handed about it that they were actually investigated by the FTC at one point for their licensing practices. Yeah, I mean, anytime you control that much of a market, the FTC is going to sniff around. Yeah, Uh, And there were other companies out there trying to bootleg games uh, still. There was one called Tengen that had a few licensed games, but they wanted more money. And so they went to the patent office and said, hey, can we take a look at that patent for these lock and key chips? 
And they said, sure, here it is. And so they, uh, I, I guess, illegally? Because they ended up getting sued and Nintendo won. So, I, I mean, I don't know how all that patent law works. I wasn't, I'm surprised that you could just go get a patent and rip it off. Uh, well, I, 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 you, you're supposed to improve upon it. They seem to have just ripped it off. But I think it's one of those things that was like gray, a legal gray area that wouldn't be decided anywhere outside of court. Oh, okay. Makes sense. You know what I mean? Yeah. So they just, ten, Tengen rolled the dice and they lost, essentially. Okay. Tengen? Tell them about. Is that it? I think so. Right. I've seen. I've actually heard it both ways. I gotcha. I just wanted to fill it out <laughs> okay. by saying it the other way. So there's this um, YouTuber named Nintendrew, and he has a video called 10 Weird NES Facts. And he talks about that, that um, key chip thing where people were trying to get around it. And he said other companies um, didn't even bother to come up with a chip. They just used a low voltage spike to, to scramble the brains of the, the lock chip. Um, so that it wouldn't work anymore, and now the game could be played. And as an example, he used a um, he used a, a game from the developer Tree, and it was for Bible adventures. <laughs> Did you so play if you that put one? Bible, no, I've never even heard of it. But if you put Bible adventures in your NES, it would scramble its brain so that you could play Bible adventures. I would think some of these might endanger the game console itself. You'd think so. Yeah, it's pretty pretty reckless. Yeah. Jesus killed my Nintendo. <laughs> right. Uh, so Rob uh, did not work out. Poor Rob um, did its job and got its foot, the little robotic foot in the door. Mm -hmm. But kids uh, were like, this is not so fun playing these games. These two games with Rob isn't where it's at. It's really Super Mario and all mm -hmm. these other games. Um, and so Rob, uh, you know, Dave kind of funnily points out, Rob uh, inevitably ended up kind of in the closet of every kid that probably owned one. Mm -hmm. And it just became about that NES system. Uh, but that's not to say all those peripheries uh, were not a success because that Zapper uh, and the game Duck Hunt were both big deals that kids loved to play. Yeah, and um, I did not realize this, but the the laser gun, the what was it called, the Zapper? Mm-hmm. It was not, it didn't shoot anything at your TV, because if you stop and think about it, your TV's not set up to accept that kind of thing, or your <laughs> no. TV screen certainly isn't. So what happened instead is it was a light detector. So when you pulled the trigger on the zapper, your screen at, in just a, a nanosecond, maybe a little slower than that, but still faster than you could register it, the screen went black, and whatever ducks were on the screen turned into white squares. Mm -hmm. And if you had the zapper pointing at the duck when you took the shot, the zapper would register that white flash of light that was a duck, that square, and it would register it as a hit. That's how the zapper worked, which is pretty ingenious. Very ingenious. Uh, and the kid thinks it's a laser gun because they don't know how that stuff works. Exactly. There is no kid who picked up the zapper and didn't go pew, pew, pew. <laughs> uh, all right. I guess here at Minute 40, we'll take our second break. <laughs> oh, man. And we'll come is, is back really? and talk a little bit about what happened next. Okay, Chuck. So um, there were a couple of other peripherals that came along that were as meh as Rob was, maybe even a little meh. -er. One was the <laughs> power pad. The other was the power glove. And again, these were things that were really cool and helped advance the, the NES system and made a bunch of money for everybody. But uh, when you played with them, they weren't very good. Yeah, the power pad is uh, it was a pad. It, was a, it had another use from another company. Uh, it was called a Fun and Fitness Pad from Bandai. And Nintendo bought them out and basically repackaged it and said, hey, now you can do, like, track and field games by running on this dumb thing. And that technology is still very popular. Like, if you go to arcades, those dance games, mm -hmm. uh, and they're still, like, uh, I played one not too long ago with my daughter, Dave and Buster's, where you do, like, track and field stuff, mm -hmm. is still around. But... At home, a kid isn't going to do, like, they're inside kids because they don't want to be outside running around. Yeah. They want to be on the couch. And so the power pad didn't go so well. It ended up in the closet with uh, Rob. I almost called him Rod. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then that glove, though, the power glove, 
it was really cool, and it looks cool today. Like if I um, imagine people buy these just for Halloween costumes mm-hmm. because it looks kind of neat. But Punch Out, which is a great boxing game, uh, mm-hmm. Power Glove was kind of the only game where you really maximized what you could get out of the glove. Right. I also saw there's a, a scene in the um, Fred Savage movie The Wizard where this kid pulls out a power glove and plays Rad Racer. So it, he's using it like he's he's steering, but it just they didn't really develop any games specifically for the power glove. So it was ahead it of ended its time, up, I think. It was a little bit because um, they the, Dave likens it to Wii. Eventually, mm-hmm. Nintendo came out with the Wii system, which used essentially the same kind of technology. Uh, but yeah, it was ahead of its time. So it ended up in the closet with the power pad and Rob. Oh, man. Um, the closet's getting yeah. full. <laughs> exactly. But as as kind of clunky as those were, that, that controller we talked about, that was revolutionary. Yeah, there's a writer at GamePro named Ty K. Kim who came up with this uh, cool analogy that they found, which is that uh, what Nintendo had landed on with that controller was what... Uh, Kim referenced as the language of console gaming. Mm -hmm. And that really kind of locks it down as to what they did. Like, you know, we were talking earlier about that first NES brick. You know, it was all kind of there. Like, they grew and morphed, but that directional pad was revolutionary. Uh, Those buttons were revolutionary, and they landed on the idea of a kid holding something in their two hands and mainly using their thumbs to operate it. Uh, thumbs and pointer fingers, I guess now, but mainly thumbs. Yeah, because with the Atari joystick, you would use your thumb for the the red button, but you used your whole hand mm-hmm. to to move the joystick. This was just totally different, um, and it was really simple. It was really sleek. Everything was laid out just right, and it was it was just so perfectly made out of the gate that, like you're saying, it it just laid the groundwork for all of the console controllers to come, even today still. It's based on those. Yeah, they had. Um, it didn't start there. They had it initially on this uh, handheld game called a Game and Watch, which, if you look this, it looks like it's sort of the predecessor to the Game Boy, mm-hmm. uh, and it's called a Game and Watch because it had a a clock on it, <laughs> <laughs> so it told told the time, and it was a game. So they call it the Game and Watch. But that's where the D pad came from, and uh, Donkey Kong is a game that really took uh, great advantage of. Of the D-pad, and um, it was, it just seemed like the natural. And now they make the little mini joysticks, which are which are great. But uh, some, I think the, uh, I think the Xbox, do they have joysticks or do they still use that D-pad? I, I don't know. Remember, addicted, so I gave it up. <laughs> so you never played an Xbox? No, no. Mm. I've seen ads for it, but I can't recall the controller. Yeah, I played a lot of. Uh, my same friend, John Pindell, who you know, John, he's yeah. backstage in New York, John. He of had course. the N64. He was my GoldenEye partner, but he also got an Xbox, and we were both addicted to uh, the Tony Hawk skating game for about a year. Oh, yeah, that Great. was a good game. And that was a game that carried with you in real life, because if you played enough Tony Hawk, mm-hmm. you would just, someone who'd never skateboarded, you would be walking around in the world and going like, I could totally grind that gutter on top of that that roof. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> it's pretty funny. So the um, the um another thing that those controllers did was um, give us the cheat code. Yeah. Which I guess you could conceivably do on like an Atari joystick, but they really came along thanks to the uh, the NES because there was a developer who was trying to turn uh, the arcade game Gradius into a Nintendo game, and it was really hard. So he created this cheat code to make it uh, easier to kind of game test for him so he wouldn't have to start over every time and is extraordinarily famous. Up, up, down, down. Down, left, right, left, right, B, A, start. <laughs> and that's called the Konami code because the guy worked for Konami and it worked for Gradius, but it became much more famous with the game Contra. I never, I guess you played a lot of Contra probably, huh? For sure. Now, what was Contra? I don't even know. It was a really kind of groundbreaking shooter game okay. where um, I saw it described well as like a cross between Rambo and Aliens. Ah, okay. 
Um, so you, I, if I remember correctly, you're in some, some sort of weird other world, and you and your buddy are kind of like buff and wear like uh-huh. um, <laughs> headbands, and you have like spiky blonde hair. Oh, yeah. Um, but And you just shoot all sorts of stuff. And it's uh-huh. really neat because you get different <laughs> kinds of weapons that shoot in different ways. And at, now you're like, this is clunky and old. But it, at the time, it was – there was just, again, nothing like it on the market. Yeah. Like a lot of the games that we understand today – originated on the NES. Yeah, for sure. I, I think I've seen Contra. That sounds familiar. But if you did the up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, BA start with Contra, if you did it at the intro screen mm-hmm. um, right before the game started, you would get 30 extra <laughs> lives, which you could use to great effect. <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah. Uh, they ended up, it's a staggering number still, considering that they were uh, kept a sort of a heavy hand on the amount of games being produced. But mm-hmm. uh, they ended up with close to 700 games for the original NES. And uh, I think in 95 is when they launched the 16-bit. No, no, no. Uh, Super Nintendo was 91. Mm-hmm. And that was the one that, that I guess my roommate had where I ended up playing a lot of Super Mario. Right. Uh, and then Super Mario 2 and 3, of course, came along. Uh, we already mentioned Punch-Out. That was... I remember playing Punch Out. That was a great game. Uh, Mike Tyson was the biggest boxer in the world at the time. Uh, but there is a little fun fact that Dave dug up, and I think I remember this. But the arcade Punch Out uh, had a boxer. The Russian boxer's name was Vodka Drunkinsky. <laughs> so great. And he got changed to Soda Popinski very famously. Anyone who played Punch Out is yeah. very familiar with Soda Popinski. And one of the one of the big revelations of my childhood was that the great tiger who wore a turban with a, a gem on it, uh-huh. his gem flashed before he came at you to throw a punch. Oh, was and when it I tell? realized that you could uh-huh. predict it, yeah, <laughs> uh, it just changed my life. That's funny. It changed your life. It did. Hey, you might not have become a a podcaster. You never know. It's possible. That whole glass doors or the sliding doors Uh thing. Glass doors. Yeah, the glass ceiling. Yeah, different thing. So um, what else, Chuck? There's some other ones, too, that we have to shout out. Well, I'll shout out Tetris because that's a game I played a lot on the Game Boy. Mm -hmm. Uh, Talk about addictive. Tetris was super addictive. I think t- I literally owe Tetris to my car packing skills today. Yeah. Uh, when we go on road trips and stuff, Emily always still jokes like Chuck is going to Tetris this thing. <laughs> uh, it was great. Tetris is a very simple game. Uh, if you've never played it, it's, uh, oh, I don't even know if it's worth describing, but it's um, it's a game where you stack to different shaped blocks. Right. Uh, and when you got solid lines, a line would disappear. And the whole goal of this game is to to keep those lines low. And as it built higher and higher and higher, there was less room for those blocks to drop, and it would go seemingly go faster and faster. Oh man, it like it, it could very induce stressful. panic. <laughs> yeah, especially as they just kept building up and they're dropping, and it's like it drops right onto another block. You're up that yeah. high. It's just like you know, yeah. it's just it is very stressful. It is, but but the, it was fun. Well, and it's also. I think one of the more satisfying games ever invented uh, in that when you would, things would get a little hairy and if you got like two in a row of the exact ones that you needed Mm -hmm. and made, I think it was a Tetris when you got like, was it like five or was it four? I don't remember. Probably four because the tallest block was four high. Was it four high? But it would make all four disappear at once. And if you got a couple of those and you went from like 70% high to down to like 20% in an instant, There's yeah. no feeling like that. No. Uh-uh. <laughs> no, Tetris was pretty great. I loved it, too. It was awesome. I want to shout out some other ones. There was another one, Metroid, which I rented countless times for an entire weekend from Blockbuster. Should just And would it. spend the entire weekend with yeah. friends trying to beat it. And if I remember correctly, I never beat Metroid. But it was really groundbreaking in that there wasn't, like, some path you had to stick to. Like, you were meant to explore these vast areas and find stuff before you could advance to the next level. That was pretty new, actually. So Metroid was groundbreaking, too. And then there were other ones that were just fun to play, like Ice Hockey. Did you play that one? Mm, I, I was always into sports games, so I was I played hockey and golf. Uh, and what about tennis? Tennis, I played all those. That was fun. Did you play the MLB baseball game? I'm not sure if I played that one. That one was very addictive. RC Pro Am. 
DuckTales was actually a, a lot of fun. And then there was an army one called Jackal. And then if you liked skateboarding at the time, which I did, there was Skate or Die, which was pretty good. Mm -hmm. But my money was on Town and Country Designs Skate and Surf, I think it was called. <laughs> and you could skateboard and then you would go surf. And it was a lot of fun to play, too. Yeah, I was so uh, into the sports games. And I still play the PlayStation uh, uh, what is it? PGA 2K for their golf game. It's still a lot of fun. But uh, I played, well, I was addicted to the Atari beach volleyball game wherein it was two players aside and both players were connected to one another. They could not move independently. <laughs> so when you're moving your joystick around, they're both running in the exact same pattern. Yeah, that's hilarious. That sounds, it reminds me of another game that Dave dug up called Chase the Chuck Wagon, which was just about as bad as it got for Atari, where a dog chases the, the wagon from the Chuck Wagon commercials. It's a branded it game. Poop out, yeah. Who, who would have thought? And then it would poop out like food and the dog would eat the food. That was like <laughs> the point of the game. Uh, you should speak a little bit about Zelda, though, The Legend of Zelda. That's a game, again, that by the time that came out, it, it felt like a kid's thing. Uh, and again, we couldn't afford a, an NES. So what was Zelda all about? So I never liked Zelda. Oh, interesting. It did something to my mind or my brain that was not <laughs> comfortable. Okay. I don't know why. Wow. It's almost like, have you ever, um, what's your grocery store, Kroger or Publix? I can't remember. Uh, both, but generally Publix. Okay, so f there's a lot of people out there who are only Publix and only Kroger. And I think my theory is is that they're laid out in a certain way mm -hmm. that they appeal to one type of person and then the other one appeals to a different type of person. So if you are a Publix person and you go into a Kroger, it feels weird and uh -huh. out of place <laughs> and reality is just slightly askew. Yeah. That's how Legend of oh. Zelda made me feel. So I never got into it. But I know some people like have essentially dedicated their lives yeah. to that game. Like beyond playing it, like – probably dress up as Link, the main character, and oh, sure. have, like, all sorts of toys and stuff like that. Like, Legend of Zelda was really big, too. Yeah, and it was um, certainly not the first open-world game, but, uh, and I think there's not a, a solid agreement on what that was. Um, there are some arguments for the great Atari game Adventure uh, that was the first open-world game I played. Where, oh, really? Uh, your avatar was a square <laughs> <laughs> okay. But it was so much fun because you could go anywhere for the first time. It was really mm -hmm. different and new. But I think Zelda is kind of regarded as, or The Legend of Zelda as one of the first open world, like really good open world games, I guess. Right. Yeah. And, and advanced ones. And it was by the same guy who did Super Mario Brothers. So that's not surprising. Yeah. What else you got, Chuck? I mean, not a whole lot else. I guess we should we should definitely talk about blowing in those cartridges because I even made that joke <laughs> before we recorded because my microphone wasn't working. And mm -hmm. uh, Dave, who's sitting in for Jerry, said, unplug the cable and just plug it back in. I said, should I blow in it? <laughs> <laughs> right. And you don't want to, actually. So did you know about that, right? I blew in a lot of cartridges, Atari cartridges, too. So that was the thing. If your Nintendo cartridge didn't work, um, you would take it out of the VCR-like um, entry point, and you would blow on it. Everyone blew on it. And you put it back in, and it would work. Mm -hmm. The thing is, it, it wasn't doing anything. When you blew on it, you weren't helping it. It just hadn't made the correct connection the first time. So when you took it out and put it back in, it, the chances were that you were making the correct connection then, and then the game would work. But you, being a dumb 10-year-old, thought, well, I blew on it, so that fixed it. But the, the Nintendo long said, do not blow on these things. It's actually bad for them. And no one listened until there was this guy who came along and actually ran a study. The first... The world's first study on what blowing on a Nintendo cartridge does. And it didn't work. Uh, this is in 2012. His name was Frankie Vitruello. And, you know, it was a very rudimentary study. But, I mean, how else are you going to do it? You're going to have a control game you don't blow into, and you're going to have a game, game you blow into. Mm -hmm. And uh, after, how long did he do this? 30 days. Okay. Every day for 30 days. So, <laughs> the guy spent a month blowing on this game, mm -hmm. uh, took this the blown cartridge out at the end, and showed that it was it was corroded and kind of gross. And <laughs> yeah. uh, it's it's funny, like you don't know what kid you always wonder who invented this because every kid did it because every kid saw another kid do it mm -hmm. who just got it from some other kid. But it was just sort of known. Like you would take it out and it was always the same thing. You would do it really quick and just go 
<laughs> and like yeah. run the cartridge back and forth in front of your mouth and then stick it back in. Yeah. I mean, that sound just triggered a, <laughs> a tidal wave of nostalgia in me, Chuck. That All was right. amazing. I remember that. So don't blow in your Nintendo cartridges, people who still play Nintendo, original NES. Maybe we should uh, follow this up again one day. To, to do one on the music of Nintendo? No, well, just sort of everything we didn't cover because the N64 was such a big deal. and Sure. Uh, I don't know. This could be a, a two-parter separated by time and space. Okay. I like that idea, Chuck. Let's definitely do that. Um, and in the meantime, since Chuck and I just hashed out a second part to this episode, of course that means we've just unlocked listener mail. <laughs> Maybe next Christmas it can be our... You know, because this is kind of every year we try to do a, a toy, a famous toy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I had the same thought. I just didn't want to spill the beans. Oh, all right. <laughs> consider them spilled. Yeah, they're spilled all over. All right. Speaking of spilling all over, uh, this is a correction that on something you said that I, I don't know how I didn't catch this, but oh boy. it's the uh, we'll call it the great uh, nutter butter controversy of 2022. <laughs> uh, hey guys, at the end of the vaudeville episode, Josh said it's weird how there were two types of nutter butters, and they're totally different: the wafery kind, and then the peanut shaped cookie. And mm. I'm, I don't remember what I said. It must have just been like, huh? <laughs> I think that's exactly what you said. Uh, and he mentioned both had the same logo, same packaging, uh, which is not true. Uh, just two different types of peanut butter cookies. And I guess this is what you're talking about because we had a bunch of people write in. Uh, the peanut shaped cookies are the nutter butters. Uh, Josh, but the other wafery treats are Nutty Buddy bars. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you look? Is this what you meant? No, I think this person is from an alternate Berenstain Bears <laughs> dimension. Because in in our dimension, that there it's the same thing, same package, same name, same everything, just different cookies. But is I'm the standing by it. is the Nutty Buddy what you were thinking of though? Is what I want to know. In that person's dimension, yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, it's easy to get them mixed up, guys. If you are not a true nut specialist uh and chuck didn't pick uh pick up on it which was weird because i love both I, I don't i never buy these of course but boy a little debbie nutty bar so mm. so good i think you would like the other version of nutter butters the kind of wafery one i think you would really like it that's the nutty bar or the <laughs> nutty buddy no that's the nutter butter but i know what you're saying <laughs> oh man who, who wrote this email? Uh, this is George. I think George is going to be more confused now than ever. So George says, P.S. Gotta go. It's raining donuts again outside. <laughs> Thanks a lot, George. We appreciate the dispatch from your dimension. Hopefully you guys are having a happy holiday season there, too. And if you want to be like George and reach out and say hello, you can do that in an email. Send it to stuffpodcast at iheartradio.com. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.